Okay, so I'll get started. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending this week's Pride on Chemistry webinar. I'm Bo Xiang from UC San Diego, and I will be today's host. And before we start, I would like to introduce the schedule and mechanisms for this webinar series. So our Periton Chemistry webinar will be held every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. You must register to join each talk using the link provided here or the link we included in the reminder emails we send out every week. You can also follow our social media on Facebook and Twitter to track the updated status for each webinar. Also, we have created a Facebook group called Periton Chemistry Online Community where people in the Python field can share recent findings, research papers, and other related topics. So if you haven't joined us, uh, please do so, and then uh, we could uh, share more things here. So if you have missed the live show or the uh, would like to rewatch it, uh, you can go to our YouTube video channel called Python Chemistry Webinars, where we have uploaded all our recorded videos here. And don't forget to subscribe. And finally, I would like to explain the mechanisms of this webinar for new attendees. So during the talk, you can use the raise hand button to ask questions. And I will stop our speaker at appropriate places and enable your audio for you to talk. You can also use the chat function to discuss with everyone. And for Q&A, you can write down your questions here, which will be raised at appropriate places or by the end of the presentation. For questions that are not addressed due to a time limit, we'll collect them and send them to the speaker later. You can find the response on our social media. Okay, now let's move on to today's, uh, web today's webinar. Today's speaker is Professor Sheldon, uh, Matthew Sheldon from Texas A&M University. So Professor Sheldon obtained his uh, bachelor's degree in Carleton College in Minnesota, US. He then finished his PhD career in UC Berkeley, majoring in physical chemistry. In the year 2010, he joined his research, uh, he continued his research as a post postdoc fellow in Harry Art Waters Group in um, Caltech. And after that, he joined the faculty of in the Department of Chemistry of Texas A&M University. Professor Sheldon has achieved many awards in his faculty career, such as Air Force Office of Scientific Research Young Investigator Award in 2015, and Kanaka Junior Faculty Award in 2017, and Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation Inventor Fellow 2017 Award. He was uh, also elected to Executive Committee for the Topical Group on Energy Research and Application, APS, in 2019. His current research considers fundamental questions of optical energy conver conversion relating to plasmonic and inorganic nanoscale materials. The experiments in his team are principally designed to identify and optimize unique nanoscale phenomena useful for solar energy conversion as well as related opportunities at the intersections of nanophotonics and chemistry for broader, uh, broad application beyond the scope of solar energy. So today, Professor Sheldon will give us a talk entitled Plasmonic Platforms for Peritonic Chemistries. With all the introduction, let's give the stage to Professor Sheldon. Professor, now you can share your screen. Let me stop sharing. All right, yeah, yeah, thank ahead. you. Thank you very, very much. Um, I'm honored and excited to be here. Um, I hope everyone can see my screen. Uh, it's a pleasure. I love talking about our research, and I hope you guys find this interesting and stimulating uh, presentation. So as you said, uh, we're primarily interested in my lab in nanophotonic systems and plasmonic systems, thinking about how to leverage that for opportunities in energy. And we have recently started working on uh, opportunities that plasmonic platforms can uh, provide for 
thinking about polar atomic chemical interactions. <clears throat> and so broadly, my group has a lot of work in plasmonic systems, but um, what I'm gonna talk about today is summarized in a paper we actually just had finally appear in print online earlier this week, in fact. Uh, all the details are, uh, you can take a closer look at at this report here that was led by one of my graduate students, um, Zach Brawley. He was the, uh, the lead graduate student on the project. Um, and then also, I really, really have to thank my collaborator, uh, Matthew Pelton <clears throat> at UMBC who's someone who has for many years been a uh, mentor and a teacher for me in a lot of the related uh, concepts. Uh, and he was you know, pivotal and crucial for us to be able to get this work off the ground. And so I wanna call him out right off the bat and thank him. And I think he was in this program a few weeks ago as well and gave a really great talk that was very helpful for me. <laughs> Uh, besides that, uh, there are some other key publications in my group uh, that have some of the data I'll be talking about as well that I encourage anyone to take a look at or I'd be happy to direct and <clears throat> answer more questions about. So, you know, as I said, I'm kind of a, a newcomer to the, the polar atomic chemical uh, capabilities of plasmonic systems. And in general, uh, however, my lab has been working on plasmon driven or plasmonic phenomenon uh, with some interest in the basic properties of plasmonics for applications in chemistry for some time. And I thought it would be helpful to give some perspective on some of the key things that we've observed or some of the systems we've worked on that help motivate how we arrived at thinking plasmonic substrates could be particularly interesting for a vibrational strong coupling uh, to molecular platforms. And so I'm going to quick give a little um, uh, intro type uh, overview of two projects that were really pivotal in my lab for thinking about how plasmonic phenomenon can be sort of resonant and coherent and give rise to interesting electronic and chemical behavior based on those coherence interactions. And then also, I'll talk about how plasmonic effects have broadly uh, been researched very vigorously or very actively in the field for opportunities in chemistry. And I was sort of thinking about both of these directions that led us to some of the opportunities we, I think we've identified that can be interesting to pursue um, with vibrational strong coupling in plasmonic platforms. So if you've ever seen someone talk about plasmons before or plasmonic systems before, you've probably seen some kind of diagram or depiction like I have on this slide. And, and the, the interesting thing or the remarkable thing about a plasmonic resonance, a small nanoscale subwavelength piece of metal, is that um, the electrons are responding coherently to the driving optical field. And this causes a, a mechanical feedback resonance if we're in the limit of a subwavelength structure that can greatly enhance and concentrate the optical field in the surface in the subwavelength near field around the metal. And if we have a uh, here are some linearly polarized excitation on a metal nanoparticle. I'm doing, uh, I'm showing you here a, um, a, a full wave simulation of Maxwell's equations of the time dependent optical field. We can see the field enhancement on the right uh, is strong. It's, uh, you know, uh, an enhancement factor of like five or so in the near field of the surface of the metal. Um, However, I think what's really interesting to keep in mind uh, is that this is a manifestation of the coherent electronic motion inside the metal. And actually there's very pronounced, uh, let me put on a laser pointer here. Um, there's a very pronounced charge buildup that we can actually, you know, from a classical perspective, calculate just based on solving Maxwell's equations, where in time, at the optical frequency driven by the light field, these electrons are piling up on the surface. And I think in this calculation, this is a laser power, like I'm imagining a CW laser that I think is um, uh, like 10 to the nine watts per meter squared. So sort of like a laboratory CW laser. And you can see the surface displacement or the, the amount of charge that's moving on the surface is nearly, you know, 100% of the electron density is changing. And I think that's really a remarkable and important thing to keep in mind when, when you're understanding like why plasmonic systems can give rise to some of the sort of remarkable behavior. Uh, if you're familiar with like surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy or some of the other like strong coupling effects that have been demonstrated in plasmonic systems. It's not so much that you have um, really great Q factors or you don't, like the, the, I think the Q factor in this particular resonance is like eight. So there's like eight oscillations before it ring downs due to damping, but you have this very high intensity, or sorry, this very large population or this huge optical density of states due to all of these carriers that are uh, being modified on the surface. And this has really cool consequences, again, when you're thinking about um, the coherence of the behavior, or that is the, the extent to which you can control this motion or this movement of the electron gas microscopically based on how you define the optical field. And 
a cool, I think, an exciting consequence of this that we've pursued in my laboratory is um, actually looking what happens to these nanostructures when you sign circularly polarized light. I was just showing you a movie of a linearly polarized oscillation, but if you have circularly polarized light in which the dipole of the optical field rotates at the optical frequency, uh, well, what you see is you have now this persistent charge density wave that circulates the nanoparticle. This is not a drift current, I wanna emphasize, but this is still sort of like a wave that's circulating in the pool with a very high carrier density that's moving in circles. And so we became interested to know just, hey, this is a really interesting fundamental way you're modifying the electronic transport, the electronic behavior on the nanoscale in the system. Are there cool consequences? Can we measure the, 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 this charge density wave, these circulating currents experimentally? And the way we decided to probe this in my lab was by analyzing um, actually what's this, this phenomenon does exist. It's called the inverse Faraday effect. If people are familiar with um, magneto optic behavior, basically you can shot, uh, you can have a, a material that's magnetized and then linear polarized light will be turned. Uh, that's called the Faraday rotation or the polarization state of the light. The opposite of this is what's called the inverse Faraday effect, that you can control the polarization state of the radiation interacting with a material, and that will induce magnetization that has a static magnetic moment that's either you know, um, a linear or, an or parallel or anti-parallel with the axis of the rotation of the light based on like the right-hand rule. Um, and What's interesting in the context of these plasmonic systems, because you have this coherent mechanical motion of the electrons, um, there's some uh, really interesting feedback. So uh, this topic, the interest inver inverse Faraday effect sort of had a resurgence in the past few years because people became interested to know whether they could use like ultra fast laser pulses to have sort of um, uh, uh, read right to the magnetic state of like a computer hard drive or something like that. And so by revisiting a lot of the sort of semi-classical or just even simple continuity equations that you can use to think about in metals, how the magnetic field is manifest, um, a basic physical picture is that, uh, just like I was saying before, the circular polarization of the radiation gives rise to little circle currents that then can induce a magnetic moment. It's like conceptually, I mean, I'm simplifying for sure, but that is a very, you know, um, sort of deep physical perspective that is accurate. Um, and so just to just say this a little bit more clearly, we have, a, we have some theory papers. We have an experimental paper I'm about to show in a sec. There's been a lot of work with like varying degrees of computational analysis looking at this lately. Um, but the summary is, yeah, if you have a small sub-wavelength resonant plasmonic system, there's sort of two contributions. There's a first order effect, which is the electrons are moving in little circles due to the driving field and their coherent motion, which I think is really interesting fundamentally. And then because there's field gradients in the system, these circles are a little bit lopsided and this gives rise to a macroscopic, we call a macroscopic drift current or really a real current that you could like wire up and measure electrically that also circulates based on the handedness of the optical excitation. So uh, I'll, Really, the, the point of this story is um, I, I just wanted to make the, the, the claim that this actually gives rise to really interesting and fundamental different behaviors in the electronic and you know, physical properties of these nanoparticles. So we did an experiment with one of my collaborators uh, at um, uh, Texas A&M uh, in the chemistry department. And we thought, well, maybe we can measure the evidence of these magnetic fields in a time-resolved way. And so we performed a uh, basically pump probe experiment trying to measure this um, inverse Faraday effect where we had a pump beam that induced the magnetization in a sample of colloidal nanocrystals where we had these strong plasmonic <laughs> resonances to this inverse Faraday response. And then we probed it with just a linearly polarized beam and we measured the degree of the magnetization based on the Faraday rotation of the probe beam. But we could do this in a time resolved way. I'm simplifying a lot of the complications in the study because there were other nonlinear effects we had to um, analyze to, to get here. Um, but nonetheless, we were able to cleanly separate out the, uh, um, the effect of the inverse Faraday effect uh, or the, the response due to just the inverse Faraday effect in the system. And we saw something in the time response that I think is really cool. And that's what's summarized here on the left, that basically um, within the time resolution we had, the sort of sub picosecond um, pump probe overlap, uh, the magnetization in the material depended on the handedness of the excitation and uh, was basically instantaneous uh, you know, within our time resolution. So basically this is, this is getting to the point I was making before that 
this is a coherent effect. Basically, you can analyze this as uh, spin angular momentum from the optical field being directly transferred into the motion of the electrons, okay? Um, this is very different dynamics than in other kinds of like magnetic systems where you have to like, there's some time scale associated with aligning or de-aligning the, the spins of the electrons in, in the, the band structure. And so anyway, we could analyze this, we could measure the magnitude of the magnetic field as a function of like the optical power we were pumping the system with. And we could arrive at what was the equivalent effective magnetic field we were inducing in the material based on the optical pulse. And that's what's uh, put uh, here plotted on the left. Um, this is like the magnetic field that would be equivalent to induce the Faraday rotation we saw if we had an external magnet instead of our circularly polarized pump. And of course, the point to remember here is this is just a piece of gold colloid. It's a pretty, you know, standard experimental system that has no magnetic or, you know, very little magnetic activity under normal circumstances. And what we're able to see in the end is that um, the magnetic moment per nanoparticle actually under these fluence conditions far, exceed, far exceeded, uh, you know, the, mag the strength of magnetization you see in like, say, magnetic nanoparticles that are actually prepared for their magnetic abilities. And here we have this in this sort of ultra fast modulated light driven control. The other thing that's interesting about this is that the enhancement we see or the, the amount of magnetization in the material in the inverse area effect due to this coherent resonant feedback in the electron motion um, is many like a thousand times stronger than what you expect uh, or than what is manifest in like bulk materials. And, and this is the point I wanted to make that connects it to, to what I'm gonna get uh, talking about here in a second is that this effect, this enhancement of the magnetization we're seeing far exceeds the enhancement of the optical field. As you saw in that first slide, I showed you for this particular material system, the optical field enhancement is like an order of four or so. But we see that the magnetization that's induced is a factor of a thousand. And this is again, I think, um, hopefully giving a picture that because there's this coherent uh, resonant feedback with the driving field, the electronic structure, the material is basically, by controlling the polarization state in this system, you're actually fundamentally changing the magnetic response, the damping of the electrons, uh, the plasma resonance, the phasing time, all of these fundamental features that control uh, the, the dynamic optical and physical behavior are really modified in this system in a way that isn't just you know, field concentration that you often hear about in plasmonic systems. So I think this is an important insight for showing you can really get dramatic and pronounced and maybe even sometimes unexpected physical behavior out of seemingly standard like gold colloid in solution if you do the experiment and set it up properly. Of course, that's Yeah. Uh, we have a question from sure. Hoel, so. Hi, uh, I have a question about uh, the difference between effective B in the plot yeah. versus the actually induced B field because my understanding is that, um, yeah, I mean, you will get the optical rotation, but the effective B field, uh, I mean, you can always uh, back it out from what would be the magnetic field that you would need to induce that rotation, but that is not the real magnetic field that is used there. So, uh, right. That's, then, a, that's a really good point. I can give some more insight into how we figure out this number. So yeah, the, the, this effective B field is really just the empirical the correlation to the empirical observable of the degree of the rotation, as you're saying. Mm -hmm. But based on a simple physical model where we know the concentration, like per unit volume of these nanocrystals in solution, we can make some estimate of what's the then the contribution to the overall rotation per particle. And then we can turn that into a, continue that to give an, uh, a measure of like per atom or the magnetic moment um, per unit volume or uh, in the system. Um, but this is still an in, in a sense, an indirect measure of what, what is the local field. And we know, as you saw in the diagrams I was showing, that there are pronounced field gradients. And, and we expect interesting structure even in the microscopic distribution of the magnetic field in, 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 the, in these particular particles or in other geometries we're working on now in my lab. And so uh, uh, I think we are trying to move to other like direct measures like magnetic force microscopy or other ways um, I'll talk about in a second, where we have evidence of these magnetic fields through other types of spectroscopic analysis. And do they coincide in magnitude with, uh, because it seems that the yes. induced B field and the B effective are quite similar in your, in your report here. Uh, 
So the, um, I'm not sure I understand the distinction you're trying to make, but what I can say is that there have been some further analysis doing like um, time dependent density functional theory of like similar nanoparticles since we did this study that have predicted the magnetic moment from particles that's comparable to what we measured or, or what, we, what we assess based on our experiment measurement. And maybe I could point to some of those for a little more subtlety into the distinction between the different contributions. Okay, and, and very quick, just uh, the next question would be, what is the maximum, uh, what, what determines the maximum magnetic field that you can induce? It's just depending on the intensity of the pump? Well, that would be the naive thought, but I suspect that what is really uh, a killer, if you wanted to use this for technology or something, is uh, what I'm about to talk about. That is, there are many damping processes. There's also photothermalization. Sure. There's absorption. It's quite strong. And I suspect some of these other effects are going to start to become much more important as you go to higher and higher uh, regimes of field. Although naively, yes, it's just a linear power dependence. And that's what's predicted based on the simple classical picture. Okay, thank you, Ruben. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Th these, yeah, I, I could have made the whole talk about this for sure. <laughs> But I, I think what the other issue here, this is exactly the point. So um, people have also been now for a long time, uh, like very active research area is thinking about not these coherent effects, not the, the, the mechanical behavior or the electronic response of these metals that is um, you know, at the frequency in phase with the driving fields, but exactly how the losses could be interesting too. How do you have um, uh, non-equilibrium carriers that are excited during the plasmonic phasing? People talk about hot electron chemistry, and there's some, uh, and how these can couple to like molecular states and and drive interesting non-equilibrium photochemistry, taking advantage of this enhancement in localized, you know, photothermal heating, non-equilibrium uh, high carrier production rates, um, and do you know exotic chemical reactions like. CO2 reduction, ammonia generation, H2. I mean, this works, people report these things, um, but a challenge is that it's often uh, very low efficiency and there's just, it's complicated and there's confusion and it's not clear how to take advantage of it or understand it. And so like, uh, I'm gonna just briefly talk on this because there's some really interesting insights from our work and analysis of understanding the non-equilibrium carriers and some of the dynamic effects that we can measure experimentally and how that also is correlated to what we're seeing in some of our polar tonic studies. So um, I think a lot of people might be familiar with this if you, if you haven't heard this before, but basically there is a sort of well now established um, time scale or timeline associated with how in plasmonic systems, the energy is dissipated into the environment from the plasma resonance, how uh, dephasing of the plasma plasmonic excitation corresponds to damping that excites carriers, electrons and holes in the metal very efficiently, resonantly, because these things can also be highly absorbing when they're sub-wavelength. And then further the time scale that those electrons start to participate in like electron-electron scattering, electron surface scattering, or participate in like chemical reactions and damping processes that gives rise to a thermal distribution of the electrons, but a thermal distribution of electrons that is nonetheless not in equilibrium with the like lattice temperature or what you would call the thermal temperature of the environment or the substrate or the vibrational energy in the system. And so this is summarized uh, based on like a lot of time resolved transient absorption measurements in what's called a two temperature model, where basically in Trump probe experiments, and I'll talk about how this is manifest in the steady state uh, in a second, which is primarily what we do in my lab. But basically, you can maintain a temperature differential uh, that's fairly significant between uh, what are called hot electrons or hot carriers and the lattice temperature of the metal. And this temperature can be very pronounced because basically in a simple, um, uh, you know, just assuming that the rate at which the electrons uh, thermalize is proportional to the temperature difference between the two distributions. Um, essentially, because the electronic heat capacity is so low, moderate photothermalization that increases the temperature of the nanoscale system in the environment by like tens to hundreds of degrees by like lasers uh, can cause electronic temperature increases that are um, thousands, tens of thousands of degrees Kelvin. So like you can heat these electrons transiently to the temperature of the sun under like re you know reasonable experimental optical fluences while the lattice is still uh, heating significantly less. And the dynamics of this and the, the electron-phonon coupling, coupling, the dephasing time of the plasma, a lot of this information 
defines the dynamics that have been studied in experiments of these systems and how that relates to the chemistry. So in my lab, we were really interested in thinking about how we could do something to give insight into these fundamental chemical processes, specifically in the steady state. We're very interested in my lab in like CW or uh, time independent phenomenon, even though you have these dynamic effects. And so we were really interested in how this two temperature behavior could be applied to something uh, that's called like a thermionic power converter. A lot of the projects in my lab are interested in thinking about um, the uh, opportunities for solar. And we thought that um, because we knew it was possible or it was proposed in these plasmonic systems that you can superheat the electron gas, even though the lattice temperature doesn't necessarily reach as high as as high of a temperature. It could be possible to uh, have thermionic emission from the metal. And that just means basically you boil off the electrons, you superheat them so that a significant fraction of their kinetic energy exceeds the work function of the metal, and then it vacuum emits and that corresponds to a power cycle. This was looked at in the 70s when there was a lot of interest in renewable energy, and it still is looked at in the community in various ways. Um, but a huge challenge is just the thermal stability of materials. If you heat them up to these temperatures, usually you have to go to very, very high temperatures, thousands of Kelvin, to get significant electronic populations above the work function. And then that means you just have thermally destabilize the system. So we thought there was a really cool opportunity to think about how you could keep the electrons hot without getting the lattice hot in a steady state and maybe use this as a power cycle. And in the process, we hope to learn a lot about what were some of the dynamics and the physics of these non-equilibrium carriers and how they could do chemistry just in general systems. And so to get there, uh, we actually do a lot of computational modeling and, and design and um, optimization of plasmonic substrates. And this is a piece, this will be a piece of what I'm gonna talk about in a minute, in a second as well. But basically the community, one of the things that's really interesting about working in plasmonics is there's just constantly uh, new ideas and, and innovations and, and fresh takes on how you can design substrates, how you can design the nanoscale uh, uh, features in order to give rise to resonances that have optical properties or electronic properties that you might be interested in. And so in this particular experiment, we were really interested in maximizing what's the temperature that the electrons can get or how to, how to maximize this photothermalization process in the electron gas. And through a simple platform, I, I won't go into the details here, but basically it became apparent how we could optimize it so that we could control the full angle dependent and wavelength dependent absorptivity and emissivity in a way that basically did um, maximize the amount that the energy was photothermalizing and minimizing how well it could um, uh, uh, escape into the environment so that you could really superheat the electrons. And you can sort of convince yourself theoretically that if you do this very, very well by controlling the full angle dependent and energy dependent um, uh, emissive function of a surface, you can reach the temperature of the sun, I mean, theoretically. But practically, we were convincing ourselves that we could get you know, substantial temperature increases um, by shining light on these systems. And so uh, this sort of insight, I'll talk more about specific designs in a second that are relevant for polar aerotonic chemistry. But I just wanted to show that using traditional nanofabrication procedures like um, e-beam lithography, uh, you can get very pronounced and uh, interesting electronic behavior uh, in these metal systems. So this is just some microscope images of smooth gold metal films, where on top of the smooth gold metal, we've included gold little, we've deposited gold nanostructures in regular arrays that had the optical properties I was sort of describing to optimize on the previous slide. We could cut these or isolate them thermally, put them in vacuum, shine light on them, and then intend to try to measure the thermionic emission from the electrons that we, uh, when we shine light on the system. And so that's schematically shown here on the left. Here's another example, just showing the really pronounced absorption we had in the visible spectrum that was really important for this experiment. And sure enough, what you can see is uh, you get something like a solar cell, or you get something like an IV response. You get a short circuit current density, you get an open circuit voltage that depends on the laser power. These are very high laser powers. This is a very, very inefficient solar cell. I just want to point that out. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, because this is a laser that's below the work, well below the work function of gold, we know that these, elect these are just the hot electrons. These are the non-equilibrium, the thermalized distribution of the hot electrons in our signal, uh, it turns out, because we can actually analyze this uh, very nicely in terms of a Richards expression, or basically a thermal distribution of the electron gas really nicely matches what we observe experimentally. Now, in the process of doing this, though, 
we were very interested if we could understand uh, what was going on in the, um, the lattice temperature. Or basically, I told you there's this two temperature model for um, the energetic distributions of electrons in the metal, at least that comes from the time resolve studies and the dynamics of the electronic excitation and the relaxation. And we were wondering if we could get some insight or some perspective about this by measuring the temperature of the system. And so we thought, well, we know we're getting hot electrons based on the thermionic emission that we're observing. Those electrons are superheated. They had to have been at thousands of degrees Kelvin. But what was the temperature of the metal, the lattice, the vibrational energy in the system when we were doing these experiments? Was it the same? Unlikely, because the metal was fine. It wasn't melting. <laughs> I mean, we could look at the structures we made before and after we did these experiments, and they looked the same. And we would expect the metal to melt if we were at thousands of degrees Kelvin. So we turned to Raman thermometry. Uh, and Raman is a, is a, a major analytical tool in my laboratory. And I'll talk more about Raman in a moment. But basically, historically, if you have Raman active materials with like well-defined uh, phonon modes or vibrational modes, um, there's a technique that physical chemists, I think, are very aware of called anti-Stokes Raman thermometry, where basically uh, here's the Raman spectrum, say, of a silicon substrate. Uh, the Rayleigh line is the big line in the middle, and there's the Stokes peak and the anti-Stokes peak. And the anti-Stokes scattering, which corresponds to an upconversion event of the, um, the Rayleigh scattering, uh, is thermally activated. And it's a, a primary thermometer because it basically follows a Boltzmann distribution. And this is a way, without any other calibration than the peak ratio, that you can measure the vibrational temperature of a material. The problem is you can't do this with metals. Uh, people probably know that metals are not Raman active or they don't have polarizability that allows you to do a Raman experiment. Well, that's actually kind of a lie um, or that's a fiction that is it's not quite accurate. If you try to measure a Raman signal from a plasmonic metal nanostructure or a metal array like I'm showing right here, it actually has a very pronounced um, spectral dependent behavior that is strongly dependent on temperature and it's strongly dependent on fluence and many other factors that are controllable experimentally. It's just been very difficult to understand historically what gives rise to this very complex uh, feature. Um, if people are familiar with SIRS literature, surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, this is often talked about as the broad SIRS background, uh, which has made it very difficult to be quantitative in SIRS um, uh, chemical analysis because this background goes over many orders of magnitude and is very, very broad and can be difficult to predict if you don't really know what kinds of photothermalization is happening in the system, et cetera. But to make a very long story short, this is years of work in my laboratory uh, and in, in, in discussion with the community uh, that has been, has been working on this for a while as well, um, it's actually really apparent that what you're observing in this broad Raman distribution is the basically the energetic distribution of the electron gas near the Fermi level. And uh, I'm not gonna go through this in too much detail, but essentially you can describe a master fitting equation that gives you access to the steady state behavior, because this is a CW Raman signal, that is representing or manifesting the different populations of the carrier dynamics in the steady state. So there is some dephasing going on of this, the, the localized plasma and resonance. Uh, there's electron scattering that gives, gives rise to non-thermal, sorry, th to, to non-equilibrium, but still thermalized electronic distributions that are at these thousands of degrees Kelvin I was talking about. And then there's also the signature of those electrons that have now relaxed and are thermalized to the lattice temperature. And so it seems like there might be a lot of fitting parameters here, but I wanna make the point that actually these features in the Raman signal are really nicely spectrally distinct. And so you can robustly uh, fit to this and correlate it with, again, like that thermionic emission measurement I was talking about. And so basically the hot electrons, those electrons at thousands of degrees Kelvin, uh, basically just correspond to a tail that has a thermal distribution at very high anti stokes scattering energy. And then the rest of the signal, that's here, what's this sort of yellow dashed curve, um, is the signature of the dephasing the basically the energy bandwidth of the non-thermal carriers that are generated by the dephasing of the plasmon or the, um, the decay of the plasmon and then how that's interacting with the lattice temperature of the metal. Okay, so this is all to say that by looking at the Raman signature, we can analyze the um, uh, several features of the dynamics um, in the steady state, which I think is interesting. And just to sort of wrap this up to what I was talking about with the um, plasmonic photochemistry and that thermionic device, we can see that the lattice temperature in these experiments uh, matches what we control on a stage with some degree of photothermalization in the system based on how we shine the laser. Uh, 
but uh, the, that electronic temperature is still thousands of degrees Kelvin consistent with that thermionic emission. And at the same time, we can actually quantify the population of the non-equilibrium carriers uh, as being a few percent at the power densities we were working at in this experiment. And further, because we know the size of this subpopulation in the steady state, that gives us information about the decay time or the lifetime due to electron phonon coupling separate from the features of the dynamics of the dephasing, the plasma dephasing. And this is all, I mean, uh, you'll want to overfit this, but I think these are actually clear, clear signatures in the spectrum that we get from analyzing um, the plasmon, plasmonic behavior. And so I can tell you in a lot of the experiments in my lab right now, we're correlating how the electron gas, how the dynamic signatures of the, the hot electron decay and the non-equilibrium behavior in the plasmonic substrates is also correlating with what we can measure about like surface chemistry that's taking place on top of these same substrates. If we're doing like hot electron reactions and that's sort of different from the focus of my talk. But what I wanted to really emphasize here is that again, the, our ability to see this or do this is based on this, uh, this resonant enhancement and, and this ability to resolve these um, sort of interesting uh, dynamic plasmonic enhancement effects at the surface of the metal. So we can get insight into the electronic behavior in a cool way in plasmonic systems that I think gives insight into what we're trying to do. So that's a natural chapter before now I spend the rest of my talk talking about our polaritonic work. I don't know if there were any questions. Okay, <laughs> so basically this was the framework we were thinking with when we tried to jump in and start to say, hey, well, we know we can have strong coherent interactions between the electron cloud and an optical field. And we know we can perturb chemistry and we can get really interesting exotic um, coupling effects with, the, um, with how the non-equilibrium electrons are behaving. So can we do something interesting by controlling chemistry uh, with molecules deposited on some of these substrates and our simple objective was something very naively like a microwave oven. Could we just make substrates that were emissive or absorbing very strongly resonantly with different vibrational modes in molecules that we put on the surface? And uh, we were not specifically thinking about strong coupling when we started this or strong vibrational coupling other than just a weak coupling regime where there might be an interaction. And for that reason, our interest was in a, a sort of a different chemical system um, I think compared to what a lot of people in the field have been studying, uh, we were working with a uh, copper sulfate pentahydrate. We thought this was a very interesting chemical system because it has strongly absorbing and well distinguished vibrational modes um, in its uh, the mid IR regime that we could easily target with a substrate design. And I'll talk more about this in a second. Um, and these were sort of well uh, characterized what these specific molecular motions corresponded to microscopically. And the other thing that's interesting about copper sulfate is that uh, it has a very well described for 100 years now, at least, it's very old chemistry, uh, that a chemical reaction it can participate in is a dehydration, a stepwise dehydration. So uh, the sort of natural state at room temperature of copper sulfate is a pentahydrate. And as you heat it uh, over the range of like 100 to 150 degrees, I believe, uh, you can systematically go to a pentahydrate, a trihydrate, a monohydrate, and an anhydrate state. And you can easily resolve these. And so we were thinking, hey, can we just perturb or can we modify the temperatures at which these changes occur if we are strong, uh, resonantly interacting, not even necessarily strongly coupling, but just resonantly interacting with these different vibrational modes. And we were not ignorant of the possibility that we could get strong coupling, but that was, it seemed like a stretch to me before I knew what we were doing too carefully. Um, again, I mentioned Matt Pelton early in my talk. He's uh, actually organized a conference with him a few years ago about plasmon exciton coupling. And so I, I have known for a while uh, and I've been very interested and I think there's a lot of cool work where people are looking at um, plasmonic systems that couple to uh, uh, excitonic or electronic transitions more like in the visible spectrum. And um, <clears throat> I think one of the opportunities that's been established in the plasmonics community or people who have been doing this is that even though these plasmonic resonances don't have the extreme Q factors that you might be used to in like a fabry poro cavity, um, they, despite being lossy, again, it's because of this really large increase in the density of optical states localized in these surface regions that you still actually do get um, uh, pronounced strong coupling or induced transparency effects 
and uh, and maybe someone in the audience can correct me right now, but I think currently at room temperature, the strongest Rabi splitting, the strongest evidence of strong coupling, or the, the biggest perturbative uh, Rabi splitting that's been observed has been in plasmonic systems. Um, and plasmonic systems are not historically what's been used to analyze vibrational strong coupling. Um, I think people are much more familiar with the Fabry-Perot cavities. And again, if there's someone in the audience who <clears throat> is a specialist in vibrational coupling with plasmonic systems, I'm, I'd love to learn more about your work. But as far as I can tell, it's been studied much less than this sort of dominant platform, <clears throat> which is the Fabry-Perot cavities. And there's good reasons. I think uh, there's a lot of advantages of the system, including that you can get very high Q factors. Um, but uh, if we're thinking about what's a challenge when we're trying to do chemistry or analyze chemical systems, uh, like I'm talking about, where we're just having a substrate that's kind of like a surface catalyst or something that we can put molecules on and change their behavior. Um, well, I mean, the Fabry-Perot cavities are sort of closed systems. Um, and you're fundamentally limited by the diffraction optics. I think people know that the mode volume is really important. And, and the way you get there with these Fabry-Ferro cavities is by having very, very high Q factors. But of course, then that means the line width uh, becomes problematic compared to what might be the distribution of the chemical modes you're trying to couple to. Um, actually, a few years ago, I had a conversation with someone who said it would never be possible to do strong coupling with vibrational modes because of this issue. I think they were proved wrong. Um, but then the other factor is uh, the, um, the dipole uh, orientation of the mode. Basically, the Fabry-Perot cavity is a standing wave <laughs> that is very well oriented along one axis. And so what this means is that you just simply, you can't really couple to an ensemble of samples uh, just based on the field interaction. Um, uh, people talk about the dark states. And even if you could uh, orient all of the molecules so that the strong coupling is manifest, I think the disparity between the optical density of states and the molecular density of states means that you still have this manifold of like basically unperturbed uh, molecular states. And so it makes it harder to rationalize, I, as I understand what people are seeing when they're seeing some of the chemical perturbation in Fabry-Perot cavities. But that's different from what, like what you can measure obviously optically in the dynamics and the, the signature of what is the far field optical signal. But any case, I think plasmonic resonances give you an opportunity to overcome some of these limitations. And that's what's been motivating us in this space. So I'll take a minute to talk about a particular geometry we arrived at that we think is uh, really promising. Um, and it's just a start because, one, like I said, one of the things that's interesting in plasmonics is that you can constantly see people improving and, and, and defining new types of architectures that have uh, uh, the ideal optical behavior. But we have arrived at something that's called like a Salisbury screen absorber geometry. It takes advantage of um, localized surface plasmon resonances and little nanostructures that are in an array. But then there's also a destructive, um, coherent destructive uh, feedback between a spacer layer uh, with that array and a smooth film. Okay, and based on how you can control the spacing, the diameter of the rods, you know, you can tune all the parameters based on how you do the, the fabrication, you can get really nice, sharp, tunable resonances that you can control through the mid IR um, in the near field of the substrate. And I'll give some more details about like what's the actual field distribution in a second. But if we look at, uh, for example, the, the uh, magnitude and the spectral position of this absorption peak calculated as a function of diameter size, we can also compare that to actual substrates we've made. So what I'm showing here and what I'm showing here are the experimental uh, absorption spectra collected from our substrates. And then here in blue for a point of reference is the copper sulfate uh, that we're trying to couple to. And this is the strongest, most pronounced water mode. And this is the actual absolute absorbance. It's actually at normal incidence only almost 100% absorbing on our array. And the same issue for the salt that we're trying to couple to and understand the chemistry. And just give you a perspective of what this looks like, because I think the pictures are interesting. This is again, like a smooth gold film with a little bit of a dielectric on top. And then where we put our arrays, it <clears throat> turns out it is absorbing in the visible, but it's primarily active in the mid IR. Uh, if you looked at this, um, you would, if you could see in the mid IR, these things would be very, very bright, <laughs> very emissive at that particular wavelength based on the size and shape that we picked. The thing that's really important about this, um, this architecture though is, uh, or at least from my perspective, what's I think a real opportunity is these are angle independent. That's to say 
these don't have angle dispersion. Unlike like a normal diffraction grating, right? If you hold it up and you look from different angles, you sort of see the rainbows. I mean, because uh, the angle dependence of the, um, the surface or of the, the mode that you're looking at, these don't have that. Um, these from approximately have the same amount of absorption regardless of the dipole orientation for S or P polarization from any angle uh, above the surface. So uh, this means, I mean, the takeaway from this is that we can put just disordered thin films of molecules on the surface. And no matter what is the dipole orientation of the mode we're trying to couple to, it should still in principle be able to. Um, and, and that's what I'm sort of showing here uh, on the bottom left of my slide, that basically in comparison with a perfect black body, which has completely angle independent absorption and emissive properties, our substrates, um, here, these are experimental spectrum were measured at normal incidence, but we can calculate the full angle dependent dispersion. And we see that it's basically peaked um, exactly at the color we are intending. Um, there's some small deviation, but <clears throat> moreover, most of the molecules are coupling with the orientation that we intended or are coupling with the frequency we intended regardless of their orientation. And then the other thing that's, uh, again, the, the, the opportunity of these platforms is that we can just deposit molecules on them like surfaces or sub, you know, catalysts or something like that to analyze these effects. And we can control the concentrations of the films we put down uh, and dehydrate them in controlled ways so that we get controlled thicknesses systematically. And this is a picture of what these crystal salt films look like on top of the substrates. And then, uh, oh, go ahead, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, I have a question. So, uh, is there a correlation between the diameter uh, and the separation between the two gold nanostructure? Yeah, Probably there is. You asked earlier. <laughs> oh no, no worries. So there is in this particular structure. Um, I believe the um, the periodicity was altered in order to keep the center to center distance while we change the diameter. Um, I believe that's how this uh, array was designed as a function of diameter. So, uh, but you get different resonances and I, I, this is the, the point. We, we could talk through the, um, the full design maybe offline more if you're interested in trying to do this yourself. But both the periodicity and the center to center spacing and the diameter of the disc all play a role in what particular uh, spectral range you get the absorption uh, peak. I see, I see, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're all tunable parameters that have an effect. I see. Um, yeah. Uh, so anyway, just to one point, we can put our copper sulfate down on these surfaces. We can control their thickness and using confocal Raman microscopy, uh, we can actually map out their distribution in space on the surface as well, both over our arrays and over control regions. And so we do have some good information about how and what the molecules look like on these surfaces when we've deposited them. Okay, so this is like the main key thing I'm going to talk about. So I want to be very careful on this slide to make sure everyone's following along. And then the rest of my presentation is going to be some cool interpretation and insight we have from our data sets uh, and some cool things we've observed. So on this slide here on the left, I have a summary of our experiments using these substrates to analyze copper sulfate. We put some copper sulfate down and in blue is the spectrum of the copper sulfate on regions of the chip that uh, were adjacent to where we put plasmonic arrays. So there was no coupling interaction, okay? Uh, or no array. And you can see the clear absorption peak of the water in mode in the copper sulfate. In red is the um, absorption spectrum of the plasmonic substrate when we hadn't put salt down. Before we started the experiment, we just measured the absorption resonance. And as you can see, uh, as we uh, move down this plot, the absorption peak is moving farther and farther into resonance. And then finally we go sort of out of resonance um, with the mode based on the substrate design. The black curves, so if I take you back up to the top, is the actual spectrum we measure over the array when the salt was deposited. And as you can see here, I hope, is that this plasmonic resonance peak position has red shifted in this particular uh, to, to what you see in this black curve because of the refractive index change. The salt is changing the refractive index, which also changes the resonance of the, of the um, plasmonic mode. But nonetheless, in this particular spectrum, you can see that uh, the mode of the plasmonic substrate is primarily preserved 
uh, as it was before. The magnitude's gone down a little bit, but I can talk about that in a sec. Um, and the spectral shape and the features that we can associate with the salt are also approximately unchanged. And this is because we are clearly very much out of resonance. We can go to the other end. Uh, down here on the bottom, and we can see the same thing. The plasmonic substrate has uh, red shifted. It's not anywhere near the mode once the salt uh, of, of the salt once the salt's been deposited, and the line shape and the spectral shape of the the deposited salt is approximately the same. And it's just sort of like an additive uh, um, uh, spectrum that has the two different components in it. Okay. But of course, the interesting thing is when we have mode overlap. And we did these experiments, and uh, we immediately thought we could identify, um, well, I mean, we, we, again, I, I was skeptical that we would see strong coupling, or I wasn't like holding my breath for it, but we saw a signal like this. And um, we definitely immediately thought, oh, maybe this is what's going on, actually. Uh, we have a resonance that's close to the mode, and rather than just preserving the line shape and the spectral features of the two different components additively, we're seeing something fundamentally different. We are not preserving the line shape of the salt, the unperturbed salt in blue. Instead, we have broadening, and we also have a decrease of signal intensity actually in the center, uh, which is where the mode is actually present. Okay. I'm assuming this audience is very familiar with uh, polar tonic effects and splitting and uh, Rabi splitting in strong vibrational strong coupling behavior, so I won't go through it. But this is what we thought we might have been seeing. And uh, just to, to make it a little clearer, I'll go through an analytical uh, model for describing the um, dielectric function of the salt. We were able to predict you know, where we're shifting into. And sure enough, it's the spectra where our plasmon mode shifts into resonance with the peak is where we're really seeing the most pronounced effect that we sort of naively thought could be strong coupling. Of course, this is not a very clear signature. There's a lot of things that can be going on. These plasmonic substrates are very different than Fabry-Perot resonators as well. Um, and uh, this, this is complicated. And it turns out that this particular water peak was a bad experimental choice, maybe, if we were just trying to prove that we had strong coupling, okay? I think there's two factors that you really need to sort out or you need to understand. And this is a limitation or a feature of these substrates that you have to understand. And that is, um, they have a pretty highly uh, anisid or uh, inhomogeneity in the field distribution. So even though I was able to show you that there's no angle independence or no angle dis dispersion, every orientation of molecule should be able to couple at the frequency we're interested in. Still in space, there's regions where the field is higher or lower, both in plane, which is what I'm depicting here on the left, and in the space above the substrate. This is the field distribution at a given energy as a function of distance above the surface. And so one question is, are we really just seeing complex behavior in these spectra that's due to the fact that we have incomplete or non-uniform coupling, like populations that are coupled and populations that are uncoupled? I'll tell you, I'm going to show you the analysis, but it actually seems like no, we don't see any evidence of uncoupled molecules in our far field spectra. Okay, I'll, show, I'll tell you why that's in a second. Uh, but the other possibility that's really interesting with this particular uh, sample, uh, copper sulfate, is that uh, we happen to be cu coupling to water uh, in this system because we thought that was interesting from a chemical perspective. Um, water is actually, of course, the, the primary stretching mode in water is actually two modes, a symmetric and an asymmetric stretch. And you can see in um, the salt spectrum that that splitting is a little more apparent than it is in like gas phase or pure neat liquid water. Uh, and this is because um, uh, just the features of uh, the arrangement of the water molecules and the salt crystal sort of makes that splitting a little more apparent. And then the possibility is that when we were strongly coupling, given the broad bandwidth of the plasmonic mode, basically overlapping uh, with both of these features, these two, the symmetric and the asymmetric stretching in the water, it was possible we were strongly coupling to both of these modes, even though they're ostensibly orthogonal in the molecule themselves. Uh, maybe we have some kind of uh, multi-mode coupling phenomenon mediated being through the substrate. So that I think is the more interesting and more exciting possibility. And that's what I'm gonna show you that I think was actually going on. And if we're thinking about how we're modifying chemistry or chemical effects in plasmonic systems, I think showing that you can simultaneously have strong coupling and you can induce coherent interactions between a substrate and two orthogonal modes uh, is really interesting if you're trying to think about how you can control rates and dynamics and chemical effects. So how do we, uh, at least understand the role of field inhomogeneity in the system. 
Well, we could do a control experiment. We actually, instead of putting copper sulfate, which turned out to be complicated in terms of this particular mode we were following, uh, we can use a more established, well-defined chemical system, and that's uh, PMMA. People have spent a lot of time in fabric pro cavities looking at the carbonyl stretch, excuse me, in the um, copper sulfate, uh, excuse me, in the PMMA, and then analyzing uh, that behavior based on features of the, uh, the fabric pro okay, uh, resonance. And here, the same data I was showing for the copper sulfate, I'm showing here now on the left uh, for a thin film of PMMA, which was like 400 nanometers that we deposited on the surface. And the, the sort of magenta pink color is the unperturbed molecular absorption spectrum. The red dashed line is the mode, uh, the plasmonic resonance of the substrate. And then the black curve is when we measure everything at the same time. You can clearly see sort of nice Lorentzian type line shape, but with splitting uh, and a decrease in single intensity at, our, um, at the molecular resonance, the vibrational mode we are coupling to. And what I can say is in the context of a classical two coupled oscillator model, which is a really powerful way, I think for analyzing these systems that is, it works, it allows you to establish basically the coupling constant and at least understand how good uh, to simple coupled oscillator picture is for understanding the, the interaction between in this case, our plasmonic substrate and the, um, the PMMA, uh, it's really good. So here in green is the fit to the classical two-coupled oscillator model. And in black is our uh, PMMA uh, carbonyl mode, or the, the C double bond O. And well, first of all, just based on the fitting, we can get a coupling constant and we can establish that we're in this regime of strong coupling um, that has been outlined. I can talk about this more if there's interest. Um, but what's, I think, important to, emphasize here is that this fitting does not require any um, uh, species that are uncoupled. This is assuming one coupling constant and the entire uh, ensemble of molecules, at least that we can measure in the far field, is participating in the coupling with the same coupling strength, at least within this simple physical picture, which is a little weird given what I showed you about the field inhomogeneity. And moreover, we can map out the, the whole dispersion of um, uh, sort of systematically changing the plasmonic resonance as we go through the PMMA mode. And um, uh, yeah, it, it really matches. You see the anti-crossing. It's fully consistent with the idea that there's one population of molecules with one coupling strength in our far field spectrum. And I saw a hand go up. I'll just show one more piece of data. We can actually push it and, and, and know what it looks like when we don't have that true, where we do have a population of uncoupled molecules, because we could take that same film of the PMMA that we deposited, and here's the data I showed on the left, and then just increase the thickness systematically. And, and we've done this. I don't have all the data here. Um, and then you see, oh, yeah, there's just a contribution to the spectrum that can't be fit using a two-coupled oscillator model. You have to have this linear combination of both coupled and uncoupled um, um, a species in order to give rise to the signal that you're observing. I don't know if there was a comment I needed to answer. Uh, someone had a question. Okay. Um, oh, just okay. No worries. Okay. <laughs> um, so then, uh, so just to drive home the point here, if we use, so we at least we think we have good evidence that in the far field, in the IR spectra, at least everything we can see or measure appears to be in a strong coupling regime uh, uh, with the entirety of the sample, at least according to the PMMA behavior. The analogous or comparable experiment for the copper sulfate doesn't do that. So here again is our more complex copper sulfate signal. And uh, if we try to fit it to a two coupled oscillator model, it just doesn't work. We just see the sort of two coupled spectrum that you expect. And again, this is where I talked with some of the people in the audience today to try to help understand this data. And I appreciate them for their feedback at the time I was asking questions. And, uh, and ultimately it was working with Matt Pelton at UMBC who helped us just derive an extension and, and, and helped us sort of work through the thinking of a three coupled oscillator model where basically uh, we assume that both the symmetric and the anti-symmetric or the asymmetric water stretching mode can both couple simultaneously with the plasmonic substrate. And then it's, it's really beautiful. I mean, you, you can be concerned about, again, overfitting or trying to extract too many parameters from the spectrum. But uh, sure enough, if we compare like fitting our data to a two coupled model versus a three coupled model, uh, it's really quite clear, I hope, that the three coupled model has more explanatory power uh, and there are a lot of things in 
checks we did and careful ways we tried to make sure we were doing this correctly by maintaining things about like the plasmon damping and the, 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 the chemical mode position so that we had some confidence that this is a good fit. And, and then just to sort of summarize this data, basically, just like I was able to show you, we could map out the dispersion according to a two-coupled oscillator model for PMMA. We can do the same thing now for this, both of the, the symmetric and the anti-symmetric stretching frequencies coupling with our plasmonic surface um, of the copper sulfate. And I think this is kind of cool because what we were able to show is that uh, we achieved strong coupling by this metric um, for both modes simultaneously. And if you actually go to the coupled equations of motion in the three-coupled oscillator, expression, yeah, you're getting some really interesting and complex dynamics of how energy transfer is going in between um, the two different vibrational modes and the substrate and how it's all being passed back and forth. And surely, uh, I think that could have interesting consequences for thinking about um, the chemistry. So that's the main result. I'm going to uh, wrap things up now, just give a little summary of some of the other interesting things that we're doing with this or how we're moving this forward. I don't know how much time I have left, though, and I can basically trim this down to be a conclusion if needed. I, I lost track of when I'm supposed to stop. Maybe someone could tell me. Yeah, yeah, so it's good. And uh, we have some uh, hand raising, but uh, if, you, if you want to wrap up, you can wrap up first and- Yeah, yeah. okay, I'll do that. So, yeah. um, so I'll just conclude and say that uh, I hope I've at least given you some uh, perspective on what's interesting about thinking about vibrational strong coupling using a plasmonic substrate uh, and how it compares to a fabric pro cavity and some of the questions or differences we had to analyze or think about to, to, to analyze and understand our system. Um, some of the things that I think are promising is that it's angle independent. And so if we're really trying to go to a configuration where we can start to really get rid of dark states or try to have every single molecule strongly coupled and get rid of the manifold of states that would be unperturbed. I think plasmonic systems is a promising way to get there if, if you can be smart about the design. We also showed that um, you can get multi-mode coupling at the same time to two orthogonal modes um, based on this design. And I didn't talk about all the possible ways you could continue to extend this uh, platform and, and you know spectrally pick out different modes based on having multiple resonances in your surface at the same time, et cetera. So things like that, I think, become interesting possibilities if you can nail this down. And then I guess finally, the last point I'll make is just, I think it's an interesting platform to pursue because it's like a surface catalyst or a surface um, um, uh, you know, or, uh, uh, reaction site that you can analyze and sort of systematically control if you can solve some of these other problems or understand the limitations and the opportunities. So I'll thank my lab and the funding agencies who have helped make this possible. Um, and I will thank you guys and all the collaborators and everyone for their attention and people who in the community who have helped me get to here today. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Professor Sheldon. So it's question time. Um, I'll read one question which was asked in the middle. Uh, from Will Wardley. Um, so Will asks the questions, uh, how do you measure the electron temperature here? I guess it's um, it's in pr some previous slide and separate. Yeah. So how do you measure I'll electron temperature separated from the lattice system temperature? Right, that's a really good yeah. question. We've had to answer this for a lot of um, reviewers as well in the papers where we've established this. So one thing that we can measure, we can measure the hot electrons, the non-equilibrium electrons temperature based on the analysis of the thermionic data. Um, thermionic emission has a sort of a description called the um, Richardson equation, which correlates the current density and the voltage that you measure based on the temperature of that distribution. Um, and so we've been able to correlate that with the quantitative fitting uh, that I was describing here uh, in the Raman signal. And basically, uh, to, to really simplify this physical picture, if you look at the anti-stokes side of the Raman spectrum, there's basically just like two slopes. This can really, this is a log axis, by the way. So this can really naturally just be interpreted as two separate thermal distributions. And each one of those slopes approximately corresponds to the electrons that are at one temperature, that's a lower energy temperature distribution closer to the Rayleigh line, and a higher temperature distribution. Um, and that's what's contained in this more sophisticated version of the fitting expression. But if you just fit this to like two Boltzmann distributions, 
you basically reproduce the same approximate temperature. <clears throat> so that's how we measure it. Okay, thanks. Uh, so we have more questions. Um, well, you can ask. Hi, um, I, I just with regard to your comment about elimination of dark states, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't believe in this uh, example, uh, you are really eliminating the dark state. So I, I understand that as we increase- Yeah, I think you're right. I, I don't think we are either. Okay, to be clear. Uh, the MMA layer, of course, you will see the peak of the uncoupled molecules, but also uh, with thin layers of PMMA, you also have Let dark. Back to that. Yes, uh, I think that's right. I think that's right. And I suspect the later uh, model only considers the bright states, but if you did something like a Raman experiment, you should see also the other, yes, the, the, the feature. Yeah, I didn't. Thank you. States. Thank you for the comment. And maybe we can talk about this more. So we are trying to correlate quantitatively our Raman signal with the IR spectra right now. Yeah. And I, I think, yeah, in the far field, we're, we don't see evidence of it, uh, but I don't think we're eliminating them based on this particular field distribution. And I think there's things we can do in the experimental design uh, to, tr to try to address that or understand, you know, to what extent that is present in the, um, the field distribution. And then also, yeah, maybe we can actually talk about how to, correlate, to do this quantitatively in the Raman because we do see uh, discrepancies um, quite distinct discrepancies in the Raman signal of these coupled modes versus the IR modes. And we have been trying to, to correlate it exactly to a measure of this. Thank you. Okay. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Thank you very much for the comment. Maybe I can even talk with you offline more or send you an email. Okay. Next question. Uh, Ding, you can ask questions. Uh, hi. Um, yeah, so can you go to slide 29? Yes. This yeah. One. yeah, yeah. So I noticed the blue curve in the center graph is kind of different from all the other blue curves in the in other graphs. Uh, that's due to, you know, the measurement are from different uh, sample areas. Uh, the well, uh, I'm not sure. So the, um, the aspect ratio has been changed in this image, but this, this blue curve is actually the same as this one. Uh, may, maybe you can point to what spectral feature you're, you're zeroing in on. Because the, these are all this approximately the same by my eye. Yeah, I, I, su I assume the blue curve, all the blue curves, uh, you know, that's the absorption. I mean, uh, um, for the uh, for the material, right? So they, they should mm -hmm. be unchanged. But if you look at all the columns or the graphs, mm -hmm. you, see, you know, they are kind of slightly different, especially, you know, the peak, you know. Uh, yeah, I guess the relative intensity, maybe that's what you're pointing to, the relative intensity of the two different. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, so I don't I don't know exactly how to answer that. Um, the but this is so just to give you some perspective on like what this does represent experimentally. We put the salt film down and we have it on an array and we have a smooth region of the film adjacent to the array. And actually, <clears throat> um, depending on how we do the experiment, we can collect sort of side by side at the same time. And that's how we get the corresponding um, uncoupled signal at this, uh, and compare it to the, the coupled signal. And mm -hmm. so this, I guess, is just a variation that we sometimes see in the signature of the molecule that we've deposited. I'm not sure what might be giving rise to that. OK, I see. I don't know. Do you have a suggestion or an idea? <laughs> what might, well, what that could be an indicator of? Yeah, because you know, when I study some organic material in a visible range, yeah, mm -hmm. all, I also, you know, find very similar behaviors. Maybe it's just due to a kind of a sample uh, pre pre preparation precise. I mean, maybe the molecule mm -hmm. aggregation, something like that. But I'm not pretty sure about that. But uh, yeah, I, do yeah, see I mean, these point. are like salt crystals. These are not like amorphous polymer layers or something. These definitely crystallize in oh. some sort of yeah, distribution when we deposit them. OK, I see. Thank you. Thank you. So um, yeah, maybe one last question who, uh, from an anonymous attendee typing Q&A. Uh, for, for the case of angle independent strong coupling, mm -hmm. is the strength of the coupling equal for all of the molecules of different orientations? Well, so naively, yes. Um, this 
this field distribution is in the near field and in the far field we see no dependence on the angle. All that in the near field that we see are local variations in the intensity, but these again remember this is like a snapshot of the time dependence of what's going on. There is no um, vector <laughs> which the dipole is pointing in this diagram and so it's independent of the uh, 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 the orientation of molecule, we think. I mean, but this is what we're trying to understand better or to assess or quantify this in, uh, more systematically. And I, yeah, I think this goes back to the, com the other comment earlier. Thank you, though. But yeah, we think naively that yes. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, so due to the time limit, uh, let's put an end to the day today's webinar. Yeah, it's a very interesting talk. Uh, thank you, Professor Matthew Sheldon. So uh, can thanks for having stop? me. Yeah. <laughs> Can I stop sharing? I can stop the sharing. Screen? Yes. Ooh. Yeah, I will stop. Share the stand off. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So for next webinar, we'll have uh, Professor Ritesh Agra from the University of Pennsylvania, who give us a talk entitled "Calic um, Topological Parallels" on March uh, 17th. So don't forget to register. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, today we have uh, over 60 uh, attendees and uh, it's very great. And we hope to see you all next Wednesday. All right. Bye bye. Thank you. See you. Should I leave now? Yeah, yeah. I all right. Thank you. Bye bye.